Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. It's my privilege to be joined here today by the one and only Derek Landy. Derek Landy, creator of Skullduggery Pleasant. How are you today, mate? I'm good. I am doing good. Yeah, we've just been uh, bonding over your your thing T-shirt and your comic collection. Two things that are that I uh, have in common with you, mate. I'm just not. Yeah. Uh, I just, just can't see him now, and I'm just not wearing it. But uh, excellent taste, <laughs> very good, very, very yeah. forbidden the, planet, if I must say. You know. Yes. Yeah. And and amazingly, uh, this wasn't set up because I've been. Yeah. This is how my desk. Well, it's usually cluttered, but um, the the, you know, over the pandemic, people have been. Uh, developing uh, new hobbies and and i i started collecting these huge big editions as you can see over there all the marvel yeah all the stuff that um like you know the first spider-man stories and and fantastic fours and everything that i knew by osmosis um and i knew all about them and i've seen the bits and i've seen the panels, but I never actually sat down to read the stories. So um, I've been, for the last year, I've been building up a hefty collection and I'm working my way th uh, through them. Um, and the thing that really stands out is how sexist everything was oh, back in 1963. Yeah, you're absolutely not wrong. Horrible. I mean, if you, if you look at, you're absolutely not wrong. Because uh, if you look at uh, the early the early Jack and Stan X Men and the early Jack and Stan Fantastic Fours, the uh, the female characters Sue Storm and and uh, and Marvel Girl, you know, the, the, it's Jean Grey. They're just incredibly marginalised. Like you wouldn't it's believe. just so it's horrific, horrible. isn't it? And, yeah. And all they all they care about is their hair, and they're both like part time uh, models or actresses yeah. <laughs> yeah. or and oh my god, it's. Yeah. yeah, and they are literally told, uh, stay back and you will distract us because you're so pretty. And yeah. like, oh my, oh my <laughs> know, God. Right, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, Marvel gets its props and Stan and Jack and Ditko get their props quite rightly for being quite progressive. But it's yeah. progressive for the time, you know. It, and, yes, yeah. And, and when you rock it back to 62, it's like, mm, yeah. That's yeah. all, it's not even like Mad Men done with it, a like arch knowing kind of yeah, raised eyebrows. It's, it's like it's, it was really yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. So what what I'm really looking forward to as I'm absorbing all of the comic goodness, I'm now treating it like an anthropological experiment to to get to the point where it shifts yeah get to the point where okay i can now and notice a difference in how they treat their um their female characters uh it's uh kind of it's wonderful wonderful stuff but eye-opening oh um, yeah I, and i agree with i think that's very well observed and i agree with both of those viewpoints i actually think when it begins to shift when it begins to change is um during uh Chris Claremont and John Burns run on the X Men. Because so Claremont was very into go. <laughs> yeah. So you got a lot. It, I mean, it's a long fucking time, mate. You know. Yeah. I mean, you're talking twenty years of Marvel comics before yeah. you get to that point, and they're yeah. all awesome. But you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a and, bit of a ride. And, and the amazing thing is, you can really uh, trace um, the flow of comics into superhero comics because every hero. Like a daredevil was in love with, um, oh god, oh, uh, Karen Page, uh, Karen, yes, yeah. and he didn't want you know, and Scott was in love with Gene, and Gene was in love with Scott, and and everyone, and and Don Blake was in love, and and they all have this, this, um, this love for the characters around them that they dare not speak about. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. It, it's, I'm, I mean, I, I haven't read the romance comics that preceded this, but I, but from what I know of comics, um, I'm sure you can trace that line through into a Fantastic Four and everything else from the romance comics that were equally huge. 
I, that is, I, I, I tell you what, Derek, that's, uh, that is absolutely spot on. And not only is that, uh, 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 that might be speculation on your part, but it's completely bang on correct. Right. You know, it, 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 so I've recently read um, Abraham uh, Reisman's uh, Stan Lee biography, uh, True Believer, on the shelf. which yeah. I would completely recommend. You're going to you're going to get a big kick out of it, particularly sure. if you want to look at Stan as a human being. It's the polar opposite of a hate geography. It's also not a hit job, which some people have described it as. It's just a clear eyed evaluation of who he is, okay. what's and all, right? And a clear-eyed evaluation of what was going on in the comics business of your creator, uh, the bottom line is nothing good, you know? And Stan was actually management more than anything else, right? But it's it's very, very interesting. But but yeah, absolutely. One of the things that kept Timely slash Marvel alive in the, uh, in the 10 years immediately prior to superhero books and their most popular titles were the romance titles. Yeah. And it was all Jack and Stan, not so much Ditko because he was the horror book guy, but Jack and Stan for sure pumped out, right. churned out tons of that stuff. And that I, until you said it, I'd never actually made the link, but the unrequited, it's not even unrequited love because it probably would yeah. be requited. It's an yes, unexpressed absolutely. love. Uh, yeah have you have you i don't know if you've got to it yet but there's there's a weird blip in a very early x-men where where stan i don't even think it's there in the original panels that and the the plot and the panels that kirby drew right i don't think it's even in there but stan like gives a gives a, a thought balloon to professor x oh yeah where he 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 gives Professor X the same unexpressed love for Jean Grey. And that's, yeah. when you read that, and I think it only happens once, you read it and just jumps off the page. It's like really weird and creepy. It's like, what? Yeah. What's going yeah. on? Yeah, and, and and I've just uh, read the, the X-Men, which is two years later. It probably is at least uh, two years later when uh, Professor X is in a bad mood and he's ordering um, everyone um, about and he he tells Jean, okay, Jean, we'll e e continue our work um, alone. And Scott has a moment where he goes, that's odd. I wonder if the professor uh, feels the same way about Jean that I do. <laughs> and, and, and again, it's, you know, it is not acted on, thank God um but uh so yeah so i have now found two instances where um it's a possibility yeah yeah, yeah no for sure and and it really drags you right at the moment whenever you read it, it's like what the fuck yeah. <laughs> it's just too much anyway mate i could talk to you about marvel comics for an hour but let's not do that because i want yes. to talk to you about about your work so um could you tell me about um uh, grimoire and its relationship to the rest of the series it, it the skullduggery pleasant grimoire started out because my girlfriend and my mother uh independently of each other started complaining is a bit harsh but at a complaining that um it is sometimes hard to keep track of who is who, especially when I introduce a character in book three, and then they aren't uh, mentioned again on, until book 14. Um, and so um, they were both, my mother needed a guide to what has happened be before. And my girlfriend uh, suggested that it would be a good idea. And um, I, it was originally going to be not uh, written by me when I um, when I told my uh, publishers about the idea to have a synopsis for each book and then to put it in a guide to the series, uh, which I thought it is just a very weird thing to do anyway. Um, as a writer, you don't want people to read a synopsis, you want them to read the actual book. Um, but I, but I, I understood that yes, it would probably be a good idea. Um, but originally, it was going to be just from all of my publisher's notes. They were going to compile them and just put them in a compendium. And I, 
I I kind of was looking at it like a lost opportunity because, um, uh, you know, yes, we could put out a compendium and it could do the job and that's it. It could just be this little guide that you dip into to remind yourself of plot points and characters. Or I could do something in, uh, creative uh, with it. So I said, right, I'll take on the writing of it and i it, it's a, a combination of our an archive of interviews with characters reflecting on their motivations and and their actions responding to um each other it basically each synopsis became a story into itself and onto itself and woven through it are two new stories that uh, didn't appear in the books. Um, so, and then there's a bunch of artwork because I just, I said, if we're going to do this, just like I do it properly and give the readers stuff that they don't, you know, otherwise have. So we have uh, 12 pages of a comic strip in the middle of it um which i'm very excited about um and uh, yeah yeah so and it became it evolved from the compendium to the almanac to the grimoire yeah um so yeah i mean i think and to have to have you involved in the process like that normally you know it, as you touched upon when a book like this gets created it's not put together. If it's Bond, it gets put together by Kingsley Amos. If it's if it's um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it gets put together by Neil Gaiman. Uh, you know, it, it's it. I I think it's a beautiful touch for you to be the guy who's put it together and to have your authentic voice running through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I've been um been very hands on from the very beginning of the series, even um going as so far as whenever my publisher is about to send out an email to the subscribers to the the website or the newsletter or whatever else they have to send it at to me first and i approve it or rewrite it um because there is a voice um not only of the characters but but the voice behind the series has to be it can't be official at uh, corporate speak it has to be a uh, personalized it has to be knowing it 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 has to sound like it's addressing you the individual instead of you at uh, the masses so um yeah i started that at book one and um it's huge amount of work yeah of course huge amount of of responsibility um but uh and whenever someone new comes to the team in my publisher's office they have to oh okay so this is how we do things with Derek and, okay yeah. right okay yeah um so yeah there's there's even though it's my voice there is a, a team of people who um who I have convinced that this is the correct way to do things. Yeah, yeah, right. I, well, I mean, well, well done and well said, mate. Um, with with regard to uh, Skullduggery Pleasant Grimoire, which we've just been talking about, um, Derek has a beautiful signed book plate edition exclusively for us at Forbidden Planet, and you can order that from the links attached to this conversation. And uh, I'd just like to close out by talking about the history of the entire project because you're getting close to the end, as I understand now. It's not that far away from book 15. Yeah. So how did it all come to you in the first place? And what has the ride been like? Oh, well, it when it came to me when Skullduggery Pleasant popped into my head and his name came first and it... I saw him, I knew everything about him. Um, and I went and I wrote the first book in in six months. And um, when I was in the publisher's office, uh, 
seated at a huge big conference table with the heads of all the departments around me, they asked, now, um, do you have plans for a sequel? And I said, well, actually, I have plans for a nine book series. And, and they all just grinned. They lit up. Um, and so for years, it was a nine book series. And, and I realized at book seven that the storylines that I had, I would, in order to condense it down to nine, I would need to egg cut corners. And I could absolutely do that. And if I was bored of it, I would have done that. And if I felt that, you know, there was, there was no life in it, I would have absolutely ended it at nine and uh, condensed everything down. But um, I was having as much fun writing the later books as I was um, the earlier books. So I let people think, I stopped saying that a book nine was the final book. And whenever someone would ask me, is it, you know, is it, it really going end to end? Is this the final book when a book nine was out? I, I said, well, at the start, I did say it was a nine book series. And they went, yes. And I said, and this is the ninth book. And they went, I suppose you're right. So I... <laughs> I maneuvered my way. I never lied. Yeah, I maneuvered yeah, my way it. around facing that question. And I let people think that book nine was the final book. And I gave them an ending that didn't uh, tie up everything. But by then they knew me and they knew that I have an aversion to tying up absolutely everything. When you, you tie up a long running series, uh, that's it. That's the end in the reader's imagination. But if you leave the threads, then even subconsciously for the reader, the characters live on. So they knew that I was uh, not averse Ed, to doing this. So um, we took two years off and I wrote the Demon Road books. And then on the 10 year anniversary of the first book, we released a book 10. Brilliant. And so that started a phase two. Um, and it, it was just, yeah, it was just, it was because of my love for, for horror and my love for comics and my love for TV shows and, you know, everything that made me who I am. It was, um, it was because of that that I was able to see the Skullduggery books as one huge long adventure, um, one huge long story. And when one thread reaches its natural end, there are three more to just um, overtake it. And so that's just how I've been, I've been operating for the last 15 years. Hey, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way to operate. And when you do finally get to 15, um, I'm loath to ask you now if that really will be the end. So I'm gonna, I won't go there. So what, what's next? What have you? What's coming up next for you? Um, I'm in the very lucky position of the world is my oyster as far as that goes. Um, I have my agent has noticed, and she noticed this years ago. Um, when I'm uh, writing a book for younger people. If I send her a script for something uh, after that, it will be the most extreme, nasty horror movie she's ever uh, read. And it's because I've had to behave so much that yeah. it all- It all comes out. Comes out. So I, um, I mean, I literally finished the grimoire a month ago and it's out like, and next week, um, or this week, or whatever week it is. Um, but, uh, and so I have been loving the opportunity to do something completely different. And I have been uh, writing um, uh, short stories 
mostly horror for grown-ups. Um, and I, I've written eight in two weeks. And it's just the, the, the pleasure is unbelievable because after writing big books, um, the, the, the idea that you can take one little idea and turn it into a story that you can start in the morning and finish the next morning. It's just, it's so freeing and liberating and, and exhilarating. So I haven't a clue what I'm going to, to do with them. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if, if, if we collect them all into an edition and release that, which is kind of dodgy because who wants to read a collection of short stories um, that haven't appeared anywhere else or that, you know, they come from an unproven um, adult author. I am a, a proven a young person author, but not an adult author. Or do I release them, um, send them to various publications? I don't know. And at the moment, I don't really care because I'm just... <laughs> I'm just having fun having the yeah. nastiest ideas <laughs> and putting them all down um, on paper. And it's just a lot of fun. Well, mate, I, I am very excited to see where they go and, and what you do with them. And in the meantime, uh, we've got a uh, Skullduggy Pleasant grimoire to satisfy ourselves with, to yes. scratch that YA itch. And, um, and it's available from the links attached to this interview, as is a whole bunch of uh, Derek's other items in the series, which is ending soon. So get your copy, your signed copy of Grimoire right now. Derek, such a pleasure to meet you and chat to you, mate. I really enjoyed that. Thank you that. very much. Thank you so much. Take care, brother. All the best. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators. Subscribe right here. See you soon.